hosted by politics and international relations here at Queen's University Belfast. Um, as the stakes are undoubtedly high for Americans voting today and who have voted in the previous weeks, and it seems that folks around the world are paying attention as well, we wanted to offer our analysis of the election and to invite your questions to inform the discussion in the hour ahead. So I am Dr. Stefan Andreasen, and my colleague who has kindly set this event up is Dr. Chris Raymond. So Chris and I are both uh, US trained comparativists who teach and research on a wide range of issues that pertain to American politics. Uh, Chris is very handily an expert on elections, on party systems and voting behavior. Uh, I study US politics from a historical institutionalist perspective, one that is often associated with a field called American political development. And we have also taught the second year American politics module together here at Queens. So we'll begin this session with two brief presentations, one by myself and then one by Chris. Uh, you can listen along and then go ahead and please type your questions for us in the YouTube chat box or window where this is being streamed. Uh, Chris has promised me to field all the hard questions and I'll happily take any easy ones if, if there are any. Uh, the other thing I should say is I am i don't see the stream. I don't know if Chris does. There's a, there's a 30 second lag between us speaking and what's streaming. So uh, to avoid any confusion, that's how we're doing this. Uh, so that may expect if there's any kind of awkward lag or other interruptions but hopefully you can listen along just fine. So what I wanted to start off with is to say a few things about the Electoral College and how a president in the US is actually elected. I do realize this is familiar information maybe for many of you who listen in, but we thought a brief uh, primer on this would be, be useful. So what we have here is a map of the Electoral College and how many Electoral College votes each state and the District of Columbia get based on the most recent census in 2010. Uh, and as you may know, presidents are elected via this college and not by a nationwide popular vote. Hence, Hillary Clinton could lose the 2016 election uh, despite getting about 3 million more votes nationwide than did Donald Trump. Uh, so the brief way to explain that is essentially that there are too many Democrats who choose to live in places like California and New York State, whereas the Republican vote is uh, a bit more disaggregated across states, which allowed, in that instance, uh, Donald Trump to uh, eke out wins in more states and thereby get the majority of electoral college votes. Okay, now the structure of the electoral college uh, has its roots in what's known as the Great Compromise, which was struck at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. Uh, this was fundamentally the compromise uh, that allowed the larger, the states with larger population to reconciliate themselves with states with smaller populations in terms of a constitutional framework for elections that would suit everyone. So the result of the Great Compromise is the bicameral representation to accommodate again both large and small states that we've had in the United States ever since, whereby the lower chamber, the House of Representatives, uh, is proportional based on the, the relative population of each state, uh, 435 members in total, and the Senate today, based on 50 states, uh, having a hundred members where each state gets two senators, right? So there's not a proportional representation. In fact, it's a very unproportional representation in the Senate or the upper house, okay? There's an interesting context here as well uh, around the issue of slavery and the three-fifths compromise and how you uh, count inhabitants for the purposes of representation, but I'll leave that to the side for now. So what we have then is an electoral college today based on the 50 states, uh, which has 538 members. So there's 538 electoral college votes in total. That is the 435 congressional districts, one electoral college vote each, plus 
the two senators, the two senatorial seats for each state being another 100 electoral college votes and the District of Columbia, which gets three electoral votes, taking us to a total of 538. Uh, this means then that a winning presidential candidate needs 270, so a simple majority of these electoral college votes to win. Uh, if there's a 269 each tie, uh, the decision goes to state congressional delegations who have one vote each, but uh, that's hopefully something we'll uh, avoid this election as well, so we'll leave that to the side. So the important point here is then that we have 51 discrete elections to elect the president, the 50 states and the District of Columbia. And importantly, in nearly all of those, uh, the election works on the basis of a winner-take-all system. So whoever gets the plurality of votes in any given state, let's say Texas, wins all the electoral college votes in that state. And again, this is why we can have a situation like in 2016, where the person who gets the most votes nationwide does not get a majority in the electoral college. Okay, and again, the two exceptions to this rule are Nebraska and Maine, where a few of the seats are um, apportioned out according to congressional districts. So those are not strictly winner-take-all systems, but they also make up less than 2% of the electoral college vote in total. Okay, uh, the, the, the other thing to say in this regard then is to re-emphasize the disproportionality of the system, which again stems from the fact that every state gets two electoral college votes for their senators, and that's equal across the states, irrespective of their population. So to demonstrate that, the easiest demonstration is California, which is the largest state with about 39 million people, has about 68 times the population of Wyoming that has less than 600,000 people, which has three electoral college votes. So California with 68 times the population of Wyoming gets only 18 times the number of electoral votes. Again, California has 55, as you can see on this map, and Wyoming has only three, okay? so. The other thing to say in respect of that is that this is why we have a discussion about the fact that the Republican Party today has a built-in or a structural advantage in the Electoral College. And people like to point this out because they note that um, it has only been in recent times Democrats who have been on the losing end of the stick where a candidate who gets the most votes nationwide does not win in the Electoral College. And why is this? Well, this is because the system, as I've just explained, uh, disproportionately benefits or, or uh, it intensifies the votes of the less populous states. And obviously the founding fathers could not sort of envision how this would play out in party politics in recent decades. But the way it works then is that states with smaller populations are generally whiter. They have a higher proportion of, of white inhabitants. They are generally older. They have a higher proportion of elderly inhabitants and they tend to be more rural in nature in terms of the geographic distribution of people in those states. And all of those characteristics are ones that tend to favor Republican candidates over Democratic ones. So that's why we talk about a built-in or structural advantage for the Republican Party. And this is why you hear in a lot of the analysis, for example, uh, people saying things like, well, to really feel comfortable about being able to win the electoral college, uh, Biden probably needs to win at least by 5% in the national vote. That's a, a very rough number, but that gives you some idea of this notion that there's a built-in advantage here for the Republicans based on this disproportionality in the electoral college. Okay. 
The other thing to say briefly then is that uh, because this is uh, by and large a winner-take-all system, again, except in Maine and Nebraska, we tend to focus on a relatively small number of states that are called swing states, which means that they could realistically go one way or the other. Everyone knows that Oklahoma and Arkansas and Mississippi will uh, turn out a win for a Republican candidate. And likewise, everyone knows that California and Massachusetts and New York State will be won by a Democratic candidate, as politics look in recent times. So those states are not in play. But the important states, again, are the ones that can go either way. And this is a map. This is the final map of the 2016 election where Trump then won against Hillary Clinton with 306 to 232 electoral college votes, as you can see here in red and blue. And in that election in 2016, while many of us uh, looked at states like Florida and North Carolina as the pivotal swing states, we missed the big story of the day in 2016, which was what I've circled here the upper Midwest, the what was called the so-called blue wall, uh, states that normally vote for Democratic candidates, but in 2016, somewhat surprisingly, voted in the cases of Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin for the Republican candidate, for Donald Trump. And this is what swung the election in Trump's favor in 2016. So that is why, looking at a map here, which is the last electoral map that NPR published ahead of the election today, we see again what's circled here, uh, a focus on that former blue wall with the assumption being on the basis of polling this year that it will reemerge for Biden and take him to victory. So on their prognostication here, we see that even if all the swing states that are considered too close to call, which are the ones in yellow, would go for Donald Trump, Biden still has enough electoral co college votes to win. Uh, what I would simply add to that is, to me, the big question mark here is Pennsylvania. Uh, and I think it's uh, indicative of the importance of the state, just how much time the two campaigns have spent on Pennsylvania uh, in the weeks leading up till today. Uh, if Pennsylvania flips and does not go blue, as is assumed here, uh, then perhaps uh, Trump has a real path to re-election. But okay, I think that's enough from me on the Electoral College and those aspects of the election. So I will switch this over to Chris to talk about a range of issues to do with the polling. So over to you, Chris. Yeah, thanks very much. So uh, what I'll start with are the, the national popular vote uh, trends that here I've, I've taken data from uh, Professor John Petrosik. Uh, he and I have been in, in close communication throughout the election cycle. And uh, he has been taking uh, all of the, the major national polls that have been conducted over the last several months. Uh, and he's tried to, to find what the, the average uh, poll result uh, is. Uh, and so taking into account uh, a number of different factors, especially the, the timing uh, in, in which this is uh, conducted, um, and trying to, to find you know, what the average uh, of the, the polls uh, is. Um, and what uh, he's done here, uh, and I've, I've taken these uh, graphs that uh, he's sent my way, he's compared the uh, poll uh, tracking that he did in 2016 to the polls that have been conducted in 2020. Uh, and if you see in the graph on the left, that there was uh, quite a bit of, of volatility that uh, throughout most of, of the election campaign, you know, Clinton had a, a pretty uh, healthy lead, but it, it did swing uh, one way or the other at a number of different points. And at the end, things tightened up quite a bit, especially in that last final week uh, before the election. If we look at the graph on the right, which looks at the data uh, over the same period of time uh, for the polls that were conducted in 2020, um, since the, the beginning of the year, the, the race really uh, kind of widened out uh, and, and Biden's lead uh, kind of widened out uh, quite a bit. And from there on out, from you know, the start of the pandemic uh, towards uh, the, the end, it, it's been a pretty uh, steady 
for Biden throughout most of this, that he's been somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 percent throughout the, the entire year. Um, and while uh, Trump had a significant dip in uh, June and the 1st of July, he did pick up some ground, uh, but, but nowhere uh, near enough to uh, be competitive in the national popular vote. Uh, and while there has been a slight uptick uh, for, for Trump in the last uh, couple of weeks, there's been a uh, somewhat of a, of a tip upward for, for Biden as well. Uh, and, and you can see it at uh, the end of the, the graph on the right that the, the race still remains quite wide uh, according to the average of the polls. So looking at, uh, at these polls, 2020 does not look to be as close of a race in the national popular vote. Uh, as it was in 2016. However, uh, there's quite a bit of variation uh, among the major polls that have been uh, conducted. So there's some major differences in the different companies that are conducting the polling. That several polls uh, in the column on the left uh, have, have got Trump closer to that 44%, uh, 45% uh, uh, range that we saw on, on the previous graph. And, and here, the, the numbers will be slightly different from the previous graph because I'm focusing only on the two-party share of the, the national popular vote. And so you know, firms like uh, the uh, NBC Wall Street Journal poll put them at 45%, uh, you at 45%. Uh, others uh, like uh, ABC and Washington Post uh, closer to 44% of the two-party vote, meaning that, that Biden would get 56% of the national popular vote. Now, if you look at some of the pollsters on the right, uh, you've got a number that show a much closer race, uh, that Rasmussen and the Investor Business Daily uh, polls have uh, Trump uh, much closer to Biden, 49 and 48%, respectively, of the two-party vote. Uh, and, and while these polls historically have uh, shown Republicans doing better in them than others. They're not alone. That uh, other polls by uh, The Hill and Harris X uh, have um, uh, Trump on 48% of the two party vote. Emerson have him at uh, 47%. Uh, Fox have him at 46%. And if we look at the most accurate pollsters from 2016, and I have those figures uh, in the right, uh, in, in the parentheses, uh, I have those underlined. The four most accurate pollsters, uh, of the four most accurate pollsters, you've got ABC and the Washington Post, uh, who uh, slightly underestimated Trump's share of the two-party vote at 48% in, um, uh, in 2016. Uh, so they're one of the uh, pollsters suggesting an easy Biden win. But the other three closest polls in 2016, Rasmussen, Investors Business Daily, and Fox, uh, Rasmussen being the absolute closest by uh, fractions of, 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 a, of a percentage point off. These three are in the column suggesting that we've got a closer race in, uh, in 2020 than uh, those in the left-hand column. So uh, I'm not sure who's going to be more accurate here, but we, we do have some divergence. Uh, and so the mean might be distorting our ability to perceive which way that this is actually going to go. If it's going to be a blowout as the uh, polls in the left-hand column suggest, or if it's going to be a much closer uh, race in, uh, as those in the right-hand column suggest. Uh, so regardless of, of who wins, somebody's going to have egg on their face uh, when predicting the national popular vote. But there are a number of uh, concerns with the polls. And here I'm not referring only to the national uh, popular vote estimates uh, that um, that, that there are a number of problems, especially with the state level polls. The, the, the national polls, as, as you could uh, glean from the previous slide, are actually pretty close to predicting the two party share of the, the national vote. Um, there, there are a number of concerns with a lot of the state level polls from 2016 that, that may have carried over into 2020. And I'll, I'll illustrate some of those here. Particularly in the battleground states, in those very same states um, that Dr. Andreasen you know, pointed out, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and I'd add to that Minnesota, had pretty uh, significant problems in 2016 uh, that significantly underestimated Trump's support. 
uh, leading to uh, uh, predictions that, especially in Wisconsin, that, that uh, Trump didn't have much of a chance, but he ended up flipping the state. Um, and uh, part of the issue uh, stems from the fact that we, we've uh, been witnessing a slow realignment of the party's coalitions over the last several elections and, and accelerated in 2016 that university-educated voters have gone uh, much more significantly to the Democrats in election after election. Those with less than a university education are increasingly going to the Republicans. And, uh, and perhaps as, as a result of this, uh, the, the 2016 polls undercounted Trump's potential base of voters among those without a university education, leading to uh, you know, predictions that, that, didn't, uh, that weren't borne out on election day. And so to solve this problem, a lot of the pollsters now are weighting their samples by education to correct for the fact that those without a university education are much less likely to participate in polls, whereas those uh, with a university education are, are more likely to participate in polls, which could distort the, uh, the, the numbers. Um, and so to, to correct for that, uh, we now weight the, the poll results by education to, to correct for any sort of imbalances relative to the share of the electorate that would be caused by this. But that still leaves open a few questions um, that uh, still plague us in, in 2020. Uh, and that is of a shy Trump voter who uh, is, if they do respond to polls, uh, might not be willing to answer honestly about how they intend to vote. Uh, we did see some evidence of this, uh, the extent of, of this was unclear in 2016, but we did see some evidence of it. There are a number of factors that I'd be happy to get into that are leading some pollsters to say this is going to be a much more severe problem in 2020 than it was in 2016. Other pollsters saying that this isn't going to be any bigger of a problem. But one of the concerns with the, the shy Trump voter is uh, they might not only be less likely to answer honestly to the polls, but uh, because uh, uh, a number of uh, the, the sort of shy Trump voters are significantly less likely to participate in the polls. There may be some problems that could be exacerbated rather than corrected by the reweighting of the data. Uh, and unfortunately, we won't know until election day uh, whether the corrections have completely solved the problem or uh, further exacerbated the problem. And then we've got an additional problem posed this year by the fact that pollsters are, are struggling to, to figure out how to deal with the early vote um, and uh, that, that a significant share of the electorate participated in voting prior to election day, uh, which uh, are on, on levels that, that we've never seen before. Uh, and one of the problems with this is trying to figure out who's actually going to show up to vote uh, because there are, are major partisan differences uh, that have been in evidence for four or five months consistently in poll after poll showing that Democrats have indicated that they uh, were going to vote early. Republicans are uh, uh, much more likely to say that they were go going to vote on election day. And so are we underestimating Trump's share of, of uh, the electorate because uh, we uh, might see a, a huge turnout among Republican voters today uh, or have, have a lot of those voters already shown up to the polls? It's not clear. Uh, and, you know, adding this variable to the equation has made it harder to figure out how to, to address this partisan difference in who's likely to show up to, to, to vote. Uh, and because of this partisan difference uh, between uh, you know, Democrats voting early and Republicans voting on election day, um, and because it's been so consistent in poll after poll, uh, what we uh, were expecting to, to observe was that Biden would uh, get a significant advantage uh, built up over the, the weeks uh, leading up to election day uh, and, and, and you know, would have a significant advantage that uh, would be able to withstand the GOP surge on election day. But again, we don't know because we don't know exactly who's going to show up to vote. So let me present a couple of concerning graphs here. Looking at the, the vote counts uh, from uh, as of yesterday evening, looking at a few of those battleground states. So first, I'll start with Florida, a state where uh, uh, it was expected that uh, Biden uh, would make significant uh, advantages uh, on um, on the early vote. But if we look at uh, estimates of who has shown up to the polls based on, on the records of who has shown up, and, and uh, the political parties collect a lot of data anytime you use a credit or debit card, 
uh, you're generating data for them that uh, is, is used to estimate how you're going to vote if you show up to the polls. Looking at those estimates of who's shown up in Florida already, Biden uh, is currently sitting on 46% as of last night, uh, according to this uh, one estimate from a firm whose sole business is doing this. Trump is sitting on 46.9%. And so if Biden needed to rack up a significant lead in the run-up to election day in Florida, he did not uh, manage to achieve that. Looking to the state of Michigan, again, another battleground. Um, here, we did see an advantage um, uh, built up by the Biden campaign. Uh, and so while we've seen as of last night about 60% of uh, the 2016 total ha has shown up to vote uh, either in person or through absentee uh, postal ballot um, you know, prior to election day. Uh, Biden is sitting on an advantage, according to this estimate, of 42.3% compared to 38.6% uh, for the Republicans. And then a significant chunk uh, of uh, individuals who have just not been classifiable, uh, at least uh, sufficiently classifiable to, to put them into one column or the next. Again, uh, if, if Biden needed to rack up uh, an early advantage uh, in the early vote, uh, this it raises a, a, a bit of concern in the state of Michigan. Turning to Wisconsin, another battleground state, same story as uh, with Michigan, that uh, here uh, the, the advantage uh, did not yet seem to, to materialize. Maybe th th those unaffiliated voters who've been through this difficult to classify, maybe they've all swung for, for the Democrats, but the, the fact that they're too hard to, to classify uh, raises some serious concerns over the Biden campaign. And again, uh, we see advantages in these last two states. Uh, a big question for today is who actually shows up to, to vote? Uh, and so if, if Trump has a, a big surge, uh, that, that uh, these two states could uh, remain in Trump's column, again, you know, putting him into contention for winning in the Electoral College. If, however, we don't see that uh, that Trump surge that the Trump campaign was, was uh, hoping for on uh, turnout uh, on Election Day, then uh, Biden might have enough to, to hold on to, or to rather take back Michigan and Wisconsin. Um, and so with that, I'm going to um, pop up the chat here and uh, if we can take any questions. Um, uh, so we've got one question so far, uh, and I believe I know this individual. Uh, are these total votes or percent chances of Biden winning the election uh, accounting for electoral college distributions? Um, so uh, if we go back a couple of slides, um, are these total votes or percent chances? Uh, yeah, so th th these were total votes um, that, that uh, the total uh, votes in this graph here, uh, but not yet allocating those who, um, um, who had indicated uh, that they, they didn't have a preference as of. Um, uh, as of the time of the sampling. On this graph, uh, so I'll pop this out. Um, on, on this graph, th these are a uh, percentage of the two party votes. So, so just focusing on Biden and uh, Trump's vote or, or Biden and Clinton's vote for the 2016 comparison. Um, turn it over to you. Um, We've got a, oh, I'm sorry, we've got another question here uh, from Joshua. Coming back to what we discussed in class yesterday, how reliable do you think calling a te Texas a toss-up is? Uh, well, l let me turn that over to you, uh, Dr. Andreasen. Uh, what uh, sort of evidence do you see um, uh, leading you to, to believe that, that Texas, uh, or, or maybe you disagree with, with NPR's assessment, uh, what evidence do you or, or others see suggesting te Texas might belong in the toss-up category this time around. Okay, well, um, you might have a better view on sort of the hard and fast data on this than I do, Chris, but I think we've seen a sort of general trend towards a kind of, uh, uh, I know it's maybe a bit of a stretch, but a sort of, you know, an extension of the Austin effect uh, 
to other metro areas of the state. So Austin being traditional, the, traditionally the state capital and sort of one liberal bastion of an otherwise quite conservative state. Uh, it looks like certainly in metro areas like uh, Houston, if maybe less so in Dallas, uh, we see some of that move as well. Um, I think that what, what's tricky to me is that a lot of that debate seems to be predicated on the fact that um, the Latino vote will break very strongly in the favor of a Democratic candidate, this time Biden. And uh, I know you probably have some thoughts about that, Chris, but that seems to me to be maybe, uh, A, the most important assumption behind all of this. So crudely put, as Texas becomes more and more Latino and less and less white, we will see it inevitably move into the blue column. Um, but B, the difficulty with that assumption perhaps is that um, the gain for Democrats simply by the state becoming more Latino uh, might be less than what is commonly assumed. I don't know if you agree with that, Chris, or not. So one of the variables that uh, a number of people uh, have wondered as to its impact on this election is the number of Californians leaving the state for Texas. That um, uh, moving van companies have uh, run out of trucks to, to help people move from California to, to Texas. That there are a number of reasons for that. Um, but as a, as a result of that, uh, it's not clear uh, how many Democrats were a part of that exodus. Uh, there, there are, there's some evidence to suggest that that uh, was a significant component to it. Uh, and, and so maybe that, that might tilt uh, Texas further into the Democratic uh, territory. There were a number of polls that came out in the last week prior to the election suggesting that Texas was going to be a, a battleground state. Uh, that uh, there was one poll that, that had, had Biden ahead by a couple of percentage points. Looking at the demographic breakdown of those polls, however, the uh, university educated share of the, the samples were vastly disproportionate to the electorate in Texas, They're significantly overrepresented in those polls. And so I'm not entirely sure uh, for that reason that, that Texas belongs in the swing state uh, column or the possible swing state column uh, because it has been Republican for quite some time. There's also the, the fact that uh, looking to surveys over the last year, there has been a massive swing uh, among Latinos toward the Republicans. Uh, part of this uh, is, a, is a demographic factor pertaining to the country of origin uh, and, and cultural traditions that you've got a lot of Cubans in uh, southern parts of, of, of the U.S. Um, uh, Texas, uh, it, it used to be historically a, a largely Mexican-American uh, population. But in the last four or five years, you've had a massive influx of Venezuelans fleeing uh, 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 Maduro's regime, and they are none too happy with the, the talk of socialism. Uh, and you, you've seen, uh, especially that latter demographic grow, and as you've seen that, um, the democratic advantage in southern states like Texas has, uh, has started to, to erode quite significantly just in the last four years. But for those two reasons, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about Texas flipping. That's really interesting. And before we go to the next question, just very quickly, what I'd add to that, though, maybe in favor of this idea that, you know, the state is, you know, inevitably moving in the, the direction of becoming a blue state is maybe the fact which you might see as a, as a, as a sort of um, act of desperation, whereby in this election, um, some Republican legislators were attempting to get some, I think, 137,000 maybe votes in Harris County, which is the largest county, which is Houston, thrown out. Um, these were so-called drive-through ballots where you could drive in and cast your vote and then leave. Uh, that attempt has now been dismissed by a federal judge. So presumably those votes will stand, but maybe this is one indication of the fact uh, not to put too fine of a point of, on it, that um, Republicans are running a little bit scared in Texas. Certainly, it it's not as comfortable for them as it used to be. Uh, 
we could go to uh, another question um, from Kyle. Is the census data recorded this year likely to impact the amount of electoral college votes available in the next presidential campaign? Uh, I'll turn that question to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's every 10 years we have a reapportionment. So some states will lose electoral college votes, the ones that aren't growing very fast. Uh, and the really fa fast, rapidly growing states will gain votes. And that means those states that lose and gain votes too, of course, will have to redraw their districts. And that's where gerrymandering comes in and all of those kind of issues. So yeah, uh, we will have the next election contested on the basis of the 2020 census, which is why these censuses are politicized and important, of course. We've got a couple of questions from Joseph who first asks, what districts do we need to pay attention to in swing states? Uh, I remember after the 2016 election that they said 80,000 votes across three swing state districts changed the vote for Trump. And the second question, it was a common assertion that lower turnout for Clinton for minorities versus Obama Coster. Polls indicate Trump is gaining ground in minority percentage points this time again. Uh, how bad for Biden is this? Uh, do you want to take that first? Um, I'm happy to do the second question <laughs> if you're happier to do the one I, I was thinking, Chris, you might have a bit more fine grained knowledge than do I of not just what the swing states are, but how districts look, if possible. Well, you, do you want to take the, the second question first, and then I'll come back to the first? Yeah, sure. I, I think this is a concern. I mean, on one hand, it seems paradoxical because we know that uh, Joe Biden swept to winning the nomination on the back of, in particular, African-American votes in the South, notably the South Carolina primary. But of course, a primary is a very different electorate from the general electorate. Um, and I do think there is some evidence uh, that uh, young black men may vote in slightly higher numbers for Trump in this election. Sure, that's from a low base, but even a small shift can have consequences. And tightly contested states like Florida and like uh, Michigan in particular, uh, but also Georgia, North Carolina and other states where there's a significant black electorate. And as we've already discussed, I think the big, big question here is the Latino electorate. And that is, of course, today the largest that has surpassed the African-American electorate as the largest minority electorate. And I think there is where Republicans for long have seen their growth prospects among minorities to lie. And again, even if Trump, of course, won't get a majority of the Latino vote, he might do better this time around. And that indeed can prove uh, very difficult in key swing states, uh, not the least among them, Florida for Biden. Yeah, I, I would add to that. Uh, Biden had a number of gaffes over the summer that uh, he botched an interview with Charlemagne the God that was, it should have been an easy one, but yeah, uh, th that was not good. Th th it does appear to have been some fallout, and particularly among African American men that uh, have not responded kindly to being told that uh, by a white guy that uh, they ain't black if, if they have trouble deciding between him and Trump. Um, and so, will that hurt Biden in places like Milwaukee and Detroit? Uh, and you know, uh, other cities like, like Pennsylvania, uh, in Pennsylvania, like uh, Philadelphia and, and Pittsburgh, um, you know, if, if that depresses African American turnout, uh, that, that that could you know, have an impact on, on those races. In terms of districts to look out for, uh, well, one of the things about presidential years uh, is that you tend to have a coattail effect that. Uh, uh, congressional candidates uh, will often uh, find themselves elected on the coattails of the the, uh, the popularity of the president in their congressional district. Now, uh, in the case of Biden, that that might lead to uh, the Democrats being able to hold on to uh, the, the massive gains that they made in 2018. Uh, Trump's relative, well, I mean, relative to any sort of baseline unpopularity is probably not going to win him, uh, win many uh, districts in many states, apart from those uh, where on, on, on uh, the map shown earlier, he did well in 2016. That, that may help uh, some, some races down ballot. Uh, in terms of swing districts to, to look for, if, if there is one district that I can identify, uh, it would be 
and I'm going to blank on, on the exact number of the district, but there's a district um, in Western Pennsylvania that had a special election um, in, in 2018 that, um, uh, that where uh, uh, there was a, a moderate Democrat who, who unseated a Republican in what was a, a very friendly uh, district to, to Trump. Uh, and there's a tight race between uh, the incumbent Connor Lamb and uh, John Parnell, who is looking to unseat him uh, on the back of, of Trump's belt. Uh, additionally, you've also got uh, a, a couple of um, uh, districts, uh, and, and Dr. Andreas pointed this out earlier, uh, because Maine and Nebraska split their votes. Uh, it could be the, the case that the congressional district for Omaha in the state of Nebraska could vote for a, a Democrat, whereas the rest of the state's electors go to, to Trump. Uh, and uh, in the state of Maine, uh, the majority of the state of Maine is very heavily Democratic, except for the con second congressional district there. That, um, uh, that, that, that district tends to be more conservative. And it's, it's a, you could see Trump uh, steal a, a, an electoral college vote in, in the state of Maine. Uh, and you know, by uh, returning the favor in Nebraska. Apart from that, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about too many of the, uh, the district level races to, to pay attention to, but th th those would be the key ones I, I'd focus on. Uh, we have a, another question from Vivian. Uh, hi, both. Thanks for this. Could you tell us more about the congressional races? How do you expect them to go? Um, it, it, from a, a general sense, um, uh, do you have a, uh, any comments to? add to that. Yeah, thanks Vivian. Um, I mean, the brief comment for me is that I haven't looked at it much. Uh, this might be a uh, 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 not me, um, not intended as a flippant answer about this, but um, uh, Nate Silver and others seems to have uh, the um, Democrats retaining control of the House at about 97 percent. I think there's a very strong consensus on that. Uh, so I suppose most of us have paid more attention to what happens in the Senate, where there's a real chance of a shift of control, uh, and of course the presidential election. Um, what I've seen uh, is that the suggestion seems to be that the um, that the Republican candidates in the House who are contesting suburban seats in the larger metro areas uh, where they where they still have seats. Uh, they lost quite a few of those in 2018, and evidence seems to suggest that that might continue. Uh, so it's uh, it's probably a quite difficult situation for uh, more Republican House uh, members than Democratic ones. I don't know if you have something to add to that. Uh, well, it's just the, the congressional race uh, looking at a, a generic ballot. Uh, so. Um, irrespective of the individual personalities running, uh, asking uh, if the election were held today, would you vote for uh, the Republicans or, or the Democrats? Uh, there's been a pretty healthy Democratic lead, not quite as big as Biden's lead over Trump, but nearly that that big uh, throughout most of the year. So um, I, I imagine that House races will be uh, very fairly similar to, to 2018's outcome. And your point about the Senate is, is, is the one to pay attention to. Oh. Uh, we've got another question. Um, it's, uh, I know you, uh, you'd rather study the demographics aspects of the election, but how relevant may the legal aspect be? Both parties having armies of lawyers to contest ballots and results. Uh, any insights on uh, the legal challenges that we're uh, about to see or likely to see? Well, I think the, the, the comment here is, is, uh, is well placed in the sense that indeed uh, both campaigns have uh, veritable armies of lawyers that are standing by uh, and, and ready to enter the fray if, if we have uh, contested uh, outcomes across states and districts and so on. Um, I think we're not likely, uh, maybe we shouldn't talk about out, yeah, uh, likely outcomes, but mm -hmm. I suppose we're not likely to see a uh, Trump landslide on the basis of the polls we've seen so far. Uh, if we see a Biden landslide, maybe it's the case that uh, some of those points about contesting results uh, in the courts become moot. But anything beyond that, any sort of slight lead or what looks like a slight win for Biden or Trump, and we're likely to get that contestation. And uh, 2000 isn't that far back in time where it took uh, more than a month and a Supreme Court decision, of course, 
for the outcome of the election to be decided. And uh, that specter of the Supreme Court, of course, getting involved becomes even more uh, tricky this time around, given that we had the very controversial rushing through of a confirmation of a new Supreme Court justice, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, just before the election or in the middle of the election, you could say, as people are already voting. So uh, I think um, anything that isn't a decisive win, and I suppose a decisive win is more likely to mean a, a decisive win for Biden, and we might have a very tricky set of circumstances to, to contend with. Both parties have armies of lawyers chomping at the bit to, to argue that the case is in all levels of, of the courts. Um, and so if, if this race is close uh, in any state, there will be legal challenges to the full extent of the law. So uh, prepare for a, a long set of challenges. Uh, another question from Connor. If the Dems take the Senate, do you imagine an increased use of the nuclear option to force reforms to filibuster, electoral college, et cetera? Hmm. So could you repeat the question again? Sorry. It, yeah. So if the Democrats take the Senate, uh, do you expect reforms to the filibuster, ending the filibuster, uh, any chance of reforming the electoral college through a constitutional amendment? Well, okay, so the first question is, well, I mean, if, if I, I, I think, and it's just a prediction, but uh, if the Democrats take both the presidency and the Senate uh, and enjoy that a majority unified government across the board, I think those questions will, will die down. Uh, there are still significant risks to, to tinkering with those uh, rules and regulations of how the Congress and other branches of government conduct their business. Uh, the other part of the question was... Well, about and, the Electoral College. Yeah, so the Electoral College, I mean, this is probably the amendment that has been spoken about and introduced more than any other to somehow get rid of the uh, Electoral College and have a different system of electing the president, given that it seems very confusing to people and, and certainly Democrats object to it, uh, given how things have played out. But look... Um, as you said, it requires a constitutional amendment, means two-thirds of states have to ratify, 50% of the states have no incentive of doing so because they are disproportionately represented. So I don't see that going anywhere. I think they would have to look at other ways of getting around that. Uh, so just as, you know, making other decisions about how you allocate your votes. But the, I think the Electoral College is there to stay. I, uh, the only thing I would add to that is um, if we do have the, uh, the, a repeat of 2016 in which Trump loses the popular vote quite significantly but wins in the Electoral College, expect uh, more attempts to, to find creative ways to get around the Electoral College. I, I uh, wouldn't be surprised if there's some sort of attempt. Uh, no, no, I agree. I agree. And, and again, it would have to be those creative ways because the amendment route is, uh, I think, nearly impossible. Hmm. Uh, another question from Samuel, uh, what effect could attempted voter suppression and uh, voter purges have in Republican leading swing states of Texas and Georgia, two states where Dems are relying on minority cities in cities to win? Um, well, there's, there, there's a long and murky history of this, right, in American politics. Um, after the uh, uh, civil rights legislation was passed in the mid-1960s. We got the Voter uh, uh, Rights Amendment in 1965 that was um, intended to protect primarily African-American voters in the South from attempts to uh, suppress their vote. Uh, that uh, Voting Rights Amendment was essentially hollowed out by a Supreme Court decision in, is it 2010, Chris? Uh, uh, Holder <laughs> versus, uh, versus Shelby County, but some sometime around 2010 that was hollowed out, and the suggestion is that several, in particular, southern states with large African American electorates, have again amended uh, election laws um, with a view to, or at least that's the accusation, to dilute or somehow suppress uh, or negatively affect the African-American vote. And I think absolutely, um, to the extent that this happens, it could have a marginal effect that could tilt results in states like Florida, North Carolina, 
Um, Georgia, certainly, again, all states with large African-American electorates, maybe less so in Texas. But um, it's a real issue. There's, a, again, it's a long and murky history there. And uh, yeah, it's, um, that, that could factor in indeed. Excited to get to this next question because it's the one on everybody's mind. Uh, what about peaceful transfer of power if Trump loses? Uh, how do you think it will change the way the legal aspects of how elections are held in future in the USA? <clears throat> do you want to start on that one, Chris? Or you don't so, have to. I, I actually I, I don't see him clinging on to power uh, as much as, as is a number of people are, are concerned. He, yeah, he's not the, the sort of person who takes well to losing. I, no, I, I don't see him giving up uh, you know, with, with a huge fight. Um, you know, and certainly the, the party is going to be much more interested than, than even he is, that the party is, is concerned with holding on to power even more than, than he is. Um, you know, it, it would be a big hit to his ego, but um, it, 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 I mean, 2000 over again, the, the, the party machinery will, will come into effect because uh, the party's you know, very much tied to, to holding on to power even more than, than Trump is. Uh, my concern is more the, the street level violence that um, you know, we might see. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think the, the last point here, Chris, is, is for me what's really important. I, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, this will play out if it comes to that you know, legally in the courts and decisions will be taken accordingly on, you know, the transfer of power and we'll have whoever is legally deemed to have won the election uh, installed come January. I, I don't have much doubt about that. But I do think, you know, we've, we've seen the specter already of, you know, the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., boarding up shop fronts and so on in, a t in, a t in anticipation of unrest and not only in Washington for that matter. We have the specter of perhaps, uh, you know, um, groups of heavily armed men and I suppose some women as well. Uh, showing up at polling stations and all the rest of it. And we know the country is terribly, terribly divided at the moment with a lot of guns uh, in circulation. I think the statistic I've seen is that there has been, uh, since the COVID lockdown, um, there's been 5 million new gun owners in the United States. That's about half the population of a state like Illinois. So that's a, that's a disturbing kind of context in which to have a contested election where there's no sort of immediate closure in terms of who has won and who has lost. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that as well. Glad you brought up the point about five million new gun owners that, uh, that that's added another variable to, to the equation. Uh, yeah, and so. and of course we've we've seen already, right? We've uh, again, not all of this has to do with with the election and Trump and Biden per se, but. Uh, it ha has had to do with, you know, the responses to the COVID pandemic as well. But, um, you know, the plans apparently uncovered about attempting to kidnap Michigan's governor, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, uh, those displays of, again, heavily armed militia in the Capitol building in Lansing and so on. Uh, that's uh, That kind of takes, I think, this election into certainly uncharted territory in modern times. I mean, we had a very turbulent uh, set of circumstances around the 1968 election, for example, but nothing quite like it since, I would say. So we've got a question uh, regarding referendums and initiatives. Uh, I'm not sure if you've been paying close attention to these, but uh, 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 as with any election year, there are also a number of referendums initiatives in a number of states or districts. Are you aware of any interesting or enjoyably bonkers initiatives or referendums? Help, Chris. This is one maybe for you. I, I, I have not really followed that this time. I mean, we, we obviously have over the course of election cycles some uh, initiatives that end up being quite significant in terms of uh, reshaping politics, sometimes locally, but sometimes nationally. But I, I'm not up to that this time around. So I don't know if you are, Chris. The only one that's come to my attention uh, is there's a referendum in California 
to uh, eliminate um, uh, legal restrictions for racial discrimination. Right. Uh, and that one is uh, be because uh, there are uh, efforts to try to um, engage in, in equity uh, uh, legislation that are constitutionally prohibited by California's Civil Rights Code. And so uh, there's an attempt to remove racial discrimination from uh, California law so that um, equity initiatives can uh, can be put in place. I have, I, I, actually, I, I was going to say, I, I have no idea how that's going to turn out, but I, I have seen one poll that suggests uh, a plurality, at least, as of a couple weeks ago, were not in favor of that one. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, anything you want to add? <laughs> no, not really, because again, it, it's just not something I've, I've kept abreast of uh, in this election cycle, really. Um, I don't know if there are more questions. Otherwise, should we say something about the Senate, maybe? I mean, that's... Uh, so we've got uh, one more question. Sure. Um, the number one issue in this election, according to Pew Research for the electorate, is the economy. Uh, GOP have traditionally owned this issue. Uh, have this year's events changed this? Could it be long term? Okay, um, depends on the, let, let's just assume if, if Trump loses, I suppose it'll depend on um, how the leadership in the GOP responds, uh, what sort of leader figures emerge, let's say post Mitchell at some point and obviously post Trump. But um, the one thing I'd say on this question is it's an interesting one because one of the things that's confused me a bit if, if I read this correctly, and, and you can correct me, Chris, if I don't, is that if anything, it seems that, uh, you know, Trump has had quite a few disadvantages in terms of polling and public opinion and so on. But, you know, his handling of the economy up until the COVID pandemic hit, and maybe even in terms of some of the views on him versus Biden in terms of engineering a recovery, Trump seems he probably does better on those economic issues than on many other issues, yet he seems to, relatively speaking, neglect those issues quite often in, in this campaign and talk much more about, for example, COVID, where I think people view his role and his responses and his leadership much more negatively. So it's been a kind of curious thing for me to understand why Relatively speaking, Trump has spoken so much about COVID. I mean, obviously it has to be addressed, but less maybe about the economy uh, where maybe he has a comparative advantage. But I'll, uh, I don't know if that's a good answer, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. So despite the, the pandemic's effect on the economy, in poll after poll, he still has a, a majority approving of his handling of the economy. And so if I... I think that, that if he manages to eke out an electoral college win, uh, it would have something to do with that, that uh, he's still uh, favorably viewed on, on that. And that's the one issue that he's, he's led uh, Biden on in, in any of the, the sort of matchups that I've seen. No. That's a good point. So, so really, if, if, if we get a, a, a Trump win here tonight, uh, despite the polls, it's maybe again back to Clinton's quip about it's the economy stupid you know, in a slightly different context this time. Uh, shall we take one more question? Uh, sure, yeah, we, we have time, that's fine. Uh, so from Samuel, if Trump loses, could the Republican Party fracture between the Trump wing and more traditional establishment wing? Oh, I think we'll have a, a holy war and some mighty, mighty infighting if, if, the, if this is the end of Trump's presidency in terms of where the party goes from here. Um, the GOP has, with relative rapidity in 2016, lined up behind Trump. That's been a very high stakes, I think, strategy for the party looking at the longer term and where the country is going demographically and where the party has to make gains to stay competitive. So if Trump loses, I think, um, uh, there must be some sort of realignment exactly how that will pan out. I don't know, but, uh, but yes, the, the short answer is there will be a, there'll be a mighty fight uh, about who is to blame and where does the party go next. That would be my, my sense. 
I'll, I'll keep my my two cents limited to the two cents uh, that I, I think the establishment wing uh, have either made peace already and have decided uh, that, that the working class folks uh, you know, that, that uh, Trump's appealed to, that's the future of the party. And those who can't get on board or couldn't get on board in 2016, they're lining up for jobs in the Biden administration. Uh, I, I don't see a, a return to uh, you know, 2016, pre-2016. Uh, I, I, I think the party coalitions have shifted already. And th there'll be a fight, but it, it'll end up in a win for uh, right, this is here to stay. Um, any, any last thoughts uh, you, you'd like to uh, end on? Uh, not really. I'm just sort of, uh, what I should say is I should say thanks, Chris, for organizing the the tech setup and for, for, for doing this analysis with me. And thanks to everyone who is uh, tuned into this event. Uh, I'm kind of eager to get back to the websites, as much fun as this has been, uh, to keep following this through the night. I guess it'll be a, maybe a long night for many of us. But um, that's my thoughts. Um, I would imagine, um, well, speaking for myself and maybe for Chris as well, that we're always happy to field questions from students and others who are interested in these aspects of American politics that we work on. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Well, uh, thanks very much, everybody, for, for attending. Uh, but uh, we hope that this has been useful. Uh, feel free to, to get in touch with either of us if you'd like to uh, you know, field any more questions.